Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. Philomena Trindade, an internationally renowned teacher, author, and lecturer on anti-aging and integrative medicine. With a master's in public health, Dr. Trindade graduated first in her class in family practice from the UC Davis School of Medicine and has been in clinical practice for over 18 years. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Trindade. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. So let's go back to your earlier years and what initially inspired you to go study medicine? Um, well, I immigrated to this country at the age of 11. I actually turned 11 on the way. And for some reason, even though I didn't speak English at the time and I was initially uh, working really hard to learn, I always found myself translating for patients in a medical setting. Um, and so that, that sort of intrigued me. And then um, I had decided that um, sort of the only way to pick myself up from my bootstraps and do something with my life was education, that that was sort of the way to survive. And um, I, so I had sort of planned a few things, like what can I do, what, um, how can I put this to you so I know I'm kind of good in the medical field and I have an interest there, you know, is that an area that I can go? But I never thought about medicine in terms of being a doctor. I thought, oh, I could be a medical assistant, you know, I could help people that way, that sort of thing. So then when I was in, by the way, my parents moved around a lot. We were farm workers. And I ended up living with my aunt for three years so I could go to the same high school. And uh, while I was in high school, my best friend at the time, uh, we started talking about, what, what do you want to do? And she says, well, I want to be a pediatrician. And, I, and so I started thinking, hmm, okay, well, I want to be a medical assistant. If she can think she can be a pediatrician, maybe I can too. So then I started saying, okay, well, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm not sure if a pediatrician is what I want, but I think I could do this. And so my plan was, what if I don't make it? So I thought, my plan's going to be, I'll go as far as it will take me. And once I fail, then that's sort of the universe telling me, that's where you're supposed to stay, and I'll be happy with that. That was my goal. So then in medical school, I mean in um, high school, when it came time to apply, I had a counselor that was really not interested in you unless you were a jock, and I was not a jock. I was more into my books and really trying to learn. And um, so I looked for someone, and I found this other counselor who allowed me to go into his office and ask him questions and stuff. And so I, he told me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, my friend Rosa wants to be a pediatrician, and I've been interested in you know the health field. So... Um, I was thinking maybe a medical assistant or something. He goes, well, why not be like your friend? Why not say you're going to be a doctor? And I said, okay. So he helped me fill out the application. And then we decided, well, where do you want to go? And I, and I said, well, where can I go? And he says, well, you have grades to apply to a UC campus. And by then my parents had settled in Watsonville, California, which is right next to UC Santa Cruz, one of the UCs. And I said, I really need to stay close to home there's a lot of things I need to help my family with, so let's pick one close to home, and that was UC Santa Cruz. And so we're looking through the catalog, and he's like, oh, they don't have a pre-med program, but they have a biology. Should we put down biology? And I said, sure. So <laughs> that's how I became a biology major. And then it turned out that UC Santa Cruz actually had a sort of a pre-med program in their biology major, and there was quite a few of us that were pre-med. And so we had a little group, and we kind of hung out and supported each other. And then when I was done, when I finished my um, undergraduate education, I actually took a next year because I did some research. I uh, wasn't really sure because all my friends are applying and they've gone into medical school. And I was like, you know, I think this is what I want, but is it really? So I decided to do public health. And I got a master's in public health first. And I love public health. And I'm really glad that I did it because it gave me a totally different understanding about research and what gets published and how to interpret you know, the, the articles that we read. Uh, but I decided I really missed that one-on-one, -on -one and I thought I w really did want medicine. So then I went to medical school and uh, went to UC Davis, which was great because I got a real primary um, medicine focus. And um, there's one thing I forgot to say here that really sort of pushed this along the way, um, and that is while I was in medical school, 
I had, you know, I, I translated for quite a few different people. But at one point, my um, best friend, the one that said she wanted to be a pediatrician, Rosa. yeah, exactly. She was translating for someone, and she took me with her. And it ended up being that she was translating for this little boy who was three years old and had um, a brain tumor. That really, really affected me. Even to this day, I still remember walking into his house, and he's like with his head on the floor, you know, just crying. And there was really a lot of problems with translation and them not understanding the family and the family not being able to convey to the doctor what was going on. And it was really a horrible experience, but it's what motivated me. I think if I hadn't had that, I probably would have said, oh, I can do something else in the medical field. But that really um, showed me how, you know, having sort of a, a cultural background in that area or just being sensitive to cultural differences can make such a big impact on someone's life and make a difference in their care, too. So that was a really big deal in terms of me sticking it out and saying, yeah, okay, I, I, can do, I think I can do this. So you graduated from UC Davis, mm -hmm. and then? And then um, I did my residency at UC San Francisco, uh, Santa Rosa, the Santa Rosa program, which is uh, very much, uh, it's a family practice program, and very much focused on sort of you working in a rural area, or at least um, learning all the things that you would need. So for example, we do surgical assisting, we learned some, we learned some surgical skills, we learned how to do C-sections, and that was really good for me because I wanted to go back home which is Watsonville area, that's what I consider home in this country. Um, and I wanted to be able to have all those skills, even if I wasn't going to use them, so to say, speak. So that was, I, I feel like I got the best training, really. So what was the catalyst for you to transition into a functional family practitioner? Mm, very good question. So I really went into medicine because I thought I would learn how to reverse disease how to treat it properly, how to get to the underlying root cause, and make a difference in someone's life. But you didn't learn that in medical school. No, I did not. And I've always had sort of this holistic approach in my own mind and how I see medicine and how I was raised in terms of, you know, using herbs and using, you know, a lot of different modalities, you know, for health. Um, I was really frustrated in medical school and residency. Um, I think residency, it was more just survival. And so the frustration was more on, you know, how can I get enough rest to think clearly because I'm dealing with people's lives. Whereas in medical school, it was like, why do I need to learn all this basic science and then I'm not going to turn around and use it? You know, why? This doesn't make any sense. And why so heavy on the pharmaceutical and nothing else? And even though, you know, I think Davis is pretty um, innovative and kind of um, out there in terms of incorporating a little bit of nutrition and and your medical school education, it's still left, you know, a lot sort of by the wayside. I mean, I remember doing an acting internship in the ICU because at one point I had thought about doing ICU medicine just because I did well in that area. And so a lot of my teachers were sort of encouraging me, encouraging me to, to pursue it. And I was lucky enough to have one of my mentors be an MD, PhD, and his PhD was in nutrition. And he would make us order magnesium and zinc and all our ICU patients. Now back then, it would take two weeks for us to get the results back. So they would go home before you got the results. But I just remember having to do the follow-up and having to call them and they were all low. And so I was like, this is more what I want. You know, this is kind of what I want to do. But then survival sets in, right? And you just kind of have to get through it. So after I finished, I um, went to work in my hometown. So I was working with farm workers, which is what I wanted to do, and that was, great in that aspect, but I felt like I didn't have the skills to really prevent some of the diseases I was seeing, or at least to arrest its progression. All I was really taught was how to use pharmaceuticals, and I knew there was another way. So I quickly became frustrated and burned out, and I burned out really early on. You know, I was uh, a medical director of a nonprofit, and I was in our, in our clinic was going bankrupt, so at the time I was both executive director and medical director, and still seeing patients. So it was, I mean, it was crazy, and I know that that contributed to the burnout, but really the main reason why I burned out was because I just was not happy. And I felt like I'm not doing my patients the service that I wanted to do them, and I don't have the tools, so how do I gain those tools? Because I can read as much as possible on my own, and I did, but that, I still felt like I didn't have a method. You know, it's like I didn't have a protocol or a way to figure out, well, how do I integrate the things that I'm learning, and how do I then turn around and put it into clinical practice. 
So I was searching and I was really questioning whether or not I was going to stay in medicine. It was a really difficult time in my life, actually. So, you couldn't go back to your guidance counselor. Yeah, yeah, no, not then. So um, I've always lived by to thy own self be true, That's sort of one of my major motives. So I decided, okay, well, I have $200,000 in loan. Let me pay back my loans, and after that, I can leave medicine. You know, I just be free to do what makes you happy. And if that means leaving, then by all means do it. And I remember telling some of my friends that, and they just thought I was crazy. They're like, you know, what else can you do? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but I'm willing to find out because I'm not happy. And I know that I can be of service in another way. So that was sort of my goal. And I enrolled in some of the re loan repayment programs where I, could, I was working in a nonprofit and that would help me get my loan sort of off my back so then I was free to make my own choices. And right around that time, I, because um, I was looking for all these conferences, right, and all these um, sort of uh, programs where I could learn some of the nutrition I had learned and some of the biochemistry. And then I was really looking for a method, you know, like a, a, a method that I could then incorporate some of the things I was learning. Well, that's when I met Dr. Smith. And there was at a university um, compounding um, meeting. And I remember talking to her, and there was a, like, as I was talking to her and telling her how frustrated I was, other people came up, and they were all women. And they're like, yeah, this is a major issue, and you know, what do we do? And I just remember her saying, stick with me. I'm getting together this fellowship. It's going to happen. Just stick out with me. You know, hang out. You know, don't despair. And sure enough, she did. And then I just fell back in love with medicine all, all over again. I was like, this is it. This is what I needed because I have the tools now and it's just a matter of me learning and going and doing this step by step. And I was lucky enough that by the time that I started the fellowship, I had gotten out of my um, debt. nonprofit. Either I'm not in my debt, exactly. Yeah, that was first, first and foremost. And then I was no longer the medical director of the nonprofit. So I actually left and then I worked part time. And so I was able to start my own practice and start implementing the things I was learning because I think that was key for me. And it's one thing that I see in a lot of our fellows now, they're not necessarily doing that. They're learning and thinking, well, I'm going to apply this in the future when I'm ready. What was the first thing that you did to implement it into your practice? Uh, the first things that I learned to do? First thing, yeah. Uh, actually, it was hormones, uh, predominantly adrenal. So I started... Learn, I learned about the problems with the adrenal dysfunction and the adrenal glands, and I started implementing that right away because it made so much sense, and gut. So it was the two areas that I started implementing, and I'm like, okay, and now I'm, I think I know a little bit about adrenals. What next? So then that led me to looking at all the hormones, looking at the thyroid and the sex hormones, and really trying to figure out how does this symphony, you know, as Dr. Smith puts it, how does it all fit together, and then how do I address that with what's going on with my patients? And and, and what are the root causes of it? Because many times, yeah, patients may present for hormones because they've heard something about it or their friends on them, but then you have to assess each person individually and you have to figure out, well, you have high blood pressure. We need to figure out why you develop high, high blood pressure because that's not normal and that has to do with insulin, I know, somehow. And then how does that fit into the big picture? So it just kept leading me into other things and it's been great ever since. And how many years has it been? Uh, let's see, um, I went out on my own in 2003 and did the fellowship, I think it was 2004 when I first started. So 13 years, wow. So how would you say your personal life has been impacted? Um, well, it's been impacted in several different ways. Uh, number one, uh, one thing I had decided when I went to the nonprofit is I gave up taking call. And that was a big deal because it was a big drain on um, my energy and, and of course, definitely contribute to my adrenal fatigue um, because I did have adrenal fatigue, not just adrenal dysfunction, but throughout all this, I've had a couple major illnesses, and that always helps you kind of keep you in the loop, so to speak, because you want to treat yourself first, right? And there's nothing like speaking from personal experience when it comes to dealing with some of the diseases we see or the dysfunctions in our patients. Um, so definitely, it's made me a much happier person. You know, it's allowed me to also work on some of my hobbies and always keep that sort of balance. So what are your you know? hobbies? Oh my gosh, I have a lot. Uh, I love stand-up paddle boarding. It's like, I'm, I'm a water really? person. Oh yeah, I'm wow. a total water person. I live part of the time in the Azores Islands. That's where I'm originally from. And so I get to do that there. In California, where I live, the water is really cold, so I have to use a wetsuit. 
uh, which I don't really like as much, but in the Azores I don't, even in the winter I could do that. I love swimming, anything to do with water. I love being active in the outdoors. I have a garden. Um, I have chickens. I have some, um, um, I just have two new baby goats. So it's really that contact with nature. And it's actually being able to go back to my island, spend some part of the time there, I think that really allows me to be able to do what I do with patients and, you know, have some times where I'm way, you know, doing too much and I'm stretched and things are, you know, way too hectic because I know that, okay, then maybe these few weeks it will be, but then I have a little bit of respite. You know, it's really finding that balance and I think we all need to do that, you know, for ourselves because you can't just do no matter what type of medicine you're practicing, but particularly, you know, when you're doing functional medicine, anti-aging medicine, whatever you want to call metabolic medicine, you really need to find that balance for yourself and you need to be able to also impact your own personal growth. What did your peers say or your your colleagues oh, in the God. medical community? That's a good one. So when I first started in family medicine, um, I went back to my hometown and, and I got to be pretty well known for being thorough and sort of knowing my stuff. And so I had a few of the specialists, in particular this one cardiologist, that would refer all his patients to me and he would say, I would only be your cardiologist if you see Dr. Trindade and she's your primary. And then um, he sort of took me under his wing and, and um, taught me a lot of things that I didn't know about cardiology. And then once I told him, he was one of the first people that I actually told, you know, I'm going to be doing this fellowship and I'm, I'm going to be going out on my own, all this referral stopped immediately. And it was, uh, it was a little bit crazy. It was actually hard for me because all of a sudden, you know, you're having all your patients see me and then I'm not that great anymore because I've chosen, you know, to do this other type of medicine. So... Um, that was a little crazy. Uh, my some of my friends just thought, well, how are you going to survive? And you know, you're going to be poor. And I'm like, well, I've always been poor, so it's not much of a difference. And <laughs> if I'm happy, missing, right? yeah, exactly. And if I'm happy, that's all that matters. And I figured, well, I can subsidize my income by working in the nonprofit, and I'm sure that will get me through, um, you know, to pay my bills. And I'll just start really small and do a lot of things on my own. And I did initially. I did my own vital signs. I actually still do. I just started with a bare minimum. How can I do this and have a very low overhead? And that's still what I teach about because it's possible. And you can sort of do everything. It means that you have to learn some skills that you may not know yet, but then you kind of know things from the ground up and anytime something goes wrong, you know what it is. And I like staying small. I've been big and I've cut down my practice because I feel like I can control it better. And it's not just that I'm a control freak, but I also like that personalized care you know, with patients. So I, I'm okay being small because I have that one-on-one -on -one and I feel like I can do much better and I don't get as overwhelmed. But you're not poor. <laughs> no, I'm not making as much money as many of my colleagues, but like my office manager says, I give away the farm and I'm okay with that. You know, I don't make as much, but I can go to bed at night and I feel good about what I do. So do you have a... Um do you have a bucket list of things that you would like to accomplish over the course of the next 10 years, whether it's personal or professional? Oh, yeah, always, uh, in both, sort of in both senses, uh, right? So um, I have a few certifications in terms of my professional life. Um, I like to do a few more, um, and I'd like to develop some of the areas, you know, in my knowledge that I feel like there's a lot more that I'd like to know in that particular um, subject. That's on my list. Uh, personally, I like to do a lot more travel. I love traveling. I love um, learning about new cultures and visiting areas of the world that I haven't been to. And I have a rule, that is I never go to a country that I don't know at least a little bit about the language and I can get by. I broke that rule when I went to Japan because I just found Japanese really difficult. So I could get by, you know, but not be able to speak it. So I'm still working on that. And, uh, and that's on my bucket list, that learn a language and then go to the countries of the world where they speak that language because then, you know, you're sort of using it and so it'll stick and you see how the way you learned it may not necessarily be the way that it's spoken or that it's used, but once you have that experience, I think it, it just opens up a lot of doors for you that if you didn't speak the language, at least in some form, that wouldn't. 
I can't help but think back to that young girl that moved to California that translated for other people. And it just, it, it's totally, you know, ingrained in you. So it's the same thing with you traveling. You want to learn the language so that way you can communicate to others when you're there and you know more about their culture. So it's really, uh, I, find that, I find that fascinating about you. Um, okay. So what is your typical patient like? Oh, my typical patient is one that's been around the block a few times in the sense that they've been to quite a few other providers in my area and they've done a few things and they've gotten a little bit better, but they haven't gotten totally better. And so they're like, I know there's something missing. I don't know what it is, but I'm hoping you can take care of me. Sometimes I think it's kind of like the, the doctor of the last resort, you know, because they've, also because I'm in an area where there's a lot of complimentary physicians, practitioners, you know, in Santa Cruz area, there's just a lot out there. And so my typical patient has been to a few other providers and they've gotten a little bit better, but they have multiple complaints and they're really trying to find someone that can put it all together. Do you have any patient success stories that you can share? Ooh, I have quite a few. Um, I think probably, um, I'm trying to think what, it's funny because my, probably my most successful patients are those that, uh, are not those that came to me for hormones. Not that I can't do that, um, but it's usually those that come in with, maybe they have hormone imbalance, but they have like severe fatigue. I'm thinking about a chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, hormone imbalance, uh, fibroid patient who's been with me for, or since I, even when I was in the nonprofit, I think she's been with me since 97. 98, since 98, um, who, um, you know, we've fixed a lot of the areas of the matrix, a lot of the underlying, um, you know, imbalances, and she's sort of been able to rejoin life, you know, so to speak. Um, and so I don't see her as often now, but... It has to be quite gratifying, though. Yeah, it is. It kind of makes it all worthwhile, you know. It's the things you have to remember on those really awful days. Like, I remember working at the nonprofit, and there were some days where things were so crazy that all I wanted to do was put some blinders on, walk out the front door, never turn around, never look back, and just keep on walking. I mean, that was like, God, can I please just do this? Do I have the guts to just do this and never turn back? Of course, I never did it. Uh, but even now in my worst days, I don't have that. You know, I can say, God, I wish for today's over. Or I have to think, oh, oh, but so-and-so is doing really well, and they had similar things. So I just have to keep remembering that, even though this is a very frustrating case, that we can get there. You know, those are the things that keep you sort of in line or um, make you less frustrated on those really frustrating days. Or I have colleagues that I can call, and I can say, I just had a big argument with this doc at UCSF, and I just could not help her see the light. You know, can I just unload on you? You know, and of course they'll say, yeah, da da da. Have you thought about this? Da, da, da. You know, because I think a big part of um, what I feel like my contribution to society is, besides helping patients, is sort of to help some of my colleagues and to share information. And I've always thought that we could meet in the science. You know, I believe that, and I still believe that. But there's some people that just don't want to see the science, and they're very jaded, and they can call someone a quack, even though the New England Medical Journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, or the British Medical Journal, has accepted their stuff for publication, and they don't think that it's bogus, right? Their research, but they'll say it is just because it doesn't fit in their little box, right? And they can't think outside the box. So we find those, unfortunately, at times on a daily basis still in medicine, and that makes it. I think even more frustrating than dealing with a frustrating patient or a patient case or a patient disease. Um, and so th that tends to happen more often than I'd like, but it's part of life. So had you quit and walked away from medicine, what do you think you'd be doing? That's a good question. I don't know. I I'm a very crafty person, so I, I love knitting, I love doing needlepoint, crocheting and flower arranging, and I know I could do that, but I wouldn't feel totally fulfilled. So I probably would have been in public health and doing some kind of ministry, some type of program, um, I'm thinking, that deal with the underserved or the needy. Well, most likely that's what I could see myself doing if I wasn't doing medicine. 
So what advice would you give to a physician who is just starting out in the fellowship? Number one, do not despair. And pick something that you want to do first. I think that's really important. Like, I picked adrenal dysfunction. I said, I'm going to learn that really well, and I'm going to, at least as best of my knowledge, and I'm going to look for why. Why did this person develop that? Always ask why, uh, and look for the, sort of, try to connect the dots between their complaints and trying to get to the underlying root cause or root causes. Because if you do that, you can end up fixing physiology. Because you can follow almost like a recipe and balance someone's hormones, for example. But that's going to happen only temporarily until you find out why they were out of balance to begin with. It's when you look for the root cause and you really try to connect the dots between what they tell you, the history, and what you find on physical exam, and you put that together and you say, okay, this is what I think is going on, and then you get your labs to prove or disprove what you think, instead of getting the labs and then saying, we need to do this. I think we need to go back to thinking uh, as physicians, right, and putting all the knowledge together and, and using our clinical skills and saying, this is what I think you have just based on your history and your physical, and really use those skills and hone down on those skills. I didn't learn those until I was in the third world and working in a very underserved area out remotely and realized, oh my gosh, I don't have really good physical exam skills, and I'm not sure how I can put that together. But then I realized this is what I need to work on. You know, I was in Guatemala working with uh, Comadronas, which are the uh, lay midwives, and developed a program to get them certified in the hospital because um, Guatemala has the highest anencephaly rate. So babies being born, you know, basically without a head, and that's a problem, not just for the baby, but for the mother. And, and there's, so there's a high mortality in childbirth. And especially if you're out in the boonies and this happens and you have an encephalic baby, most of them would die. And so we were trying to get those uh, diagnosed early and referred you know, to the hospital. And in doing that, you know, we used to do home visits, you, know, you name it. I realized that my clinical skills could really be developed a lot more. And it wasn't until I had that experience that I came back and said, okay, I need to go back and look at what can I, how much can I ascertain from a physical exam. And now that's what I do, that's kind of what I'm known for, is taking the history, the physical exam and saying, okay, this is what I think is going on, and I'm going to start your treatment today, but let's get labs just to see if I'm right. Uh, and if I'm not, then you and I are going to learn something together. We're going to figure this out. But it's important that we listen to the cues and the findings that your body's telling us, because it will tell you. If you, if you know what to look for, how there's a lot of information. How much does your intuition play into this? Um, well, I think it plays less than what most of my patients think. Because I think most of my patients think, oh, no, no, you're, you're just psychic. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I think I just honed down my skills so that when you tell me something, I'm a really good listener. And then I'm going to put that in the back of my brain, and then I'm going to go and look and see, does, can I find anything on your body? Is your body telling me the same thing that you're telling me from your history? I think I'm really good at connecting the dots and putting things together. And then trying to, to ascertain, okay, but let's filter all that through these skills that I've learned, and let's see what is really the dysfunction. Can we tie it all together? Because you may have multiple complaints that don't seem to be related. Like, you know, the pain on your big toe may not have anything to do with the reflux, but maybe it does. And can we put that together? Really? Can that be connected? Yeah, yeah, sometimes <laughs> it can. <laughs> I'm having a pain on my big toe. I don't know if it's my shoes or if I'm, it's the indigestion. I have yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so... Can you recall the very first patient that you that came to your office when you transitioned into a, an integrative or functional practice that you actually like you got you saw the results the, mm -hmm. it was it was there you you, you treated them with mm -hmm. with A B and C and you said oh my gosh this works this really works do you, do you remember that patient I remember that but that's not the one I'm going to tell you okay. about so I remember that one it was a hormone patient. Okay. And it was amazing to see, like, when she came back, she's like, hey, I'm feeling a lot better and I'm sleeping. But that's not the one that sticks out on my mind the most. Um, because, and I think it's because on that patient, I, could, I was able to order more labs and, and really understand everything. The one person that sticks out on my mind the most is that in undergrad, I did research. And the professor that I did research with uh, wrote me, you know, a stellar letter for medical school. And, which I was really surprised because initially, you know, we had a good relationship, but it was mostly a professional relationship. And I didn't think he knew that much about me personally. But it turns out that he did, and he put this in the, in the, letter, the letter of recommendation that he wrote to me. So I back on my, on my own practice, you know, and um, 
I'm probably a couple years into practice because I had moved offices, and he sends me his wife you know, as my patient. Wow. And uh, she's, you know, extremely dynamic, very well-educated uh, woman, semi-retired, does a lot of work for the community. And she tells me, um, Leo thinks you can fix me, and I don't want to do a lot of labs. So you're going to have to figure this out without ordering too many labs. I'm like, okay. So because I feel like that was the first time that I really put all this to the test, that I said, okay, let's do a really thorough physical, and let me take your history, and I'll try and put it together, and I'll tell you what I think. And But you have to agree that if with me, if there's a couple things that I can't quite figure out, you have to allow me to do the labs. And she says, okay, but I don't want you to do all those functional stuff that you say you do. <laughs> I'm like, functional labs, what she said. She goes, I said, okay, all right. And uh, it was pretty amazing. So she came to me because she was diagnosed with osteopenia. And so she didn't want to take the Fosamax that she had been prescribed and had a really adverse reaction to. And I said, okay. So I figured out that really she had a gluten sensitivity that was also contributing to her reflux that was causing her to malabsorb some of her nutrients that was then leading to the osteopenia. Hmm. And it was pretty amazing. As a matter of fact, it's one of the cases that I wrote up for the fellowship because I learned a lot through it. Because it, it, I feel like it's the first time that I sort of put myself to the test, say, okay, so I've been doing all this stuff and I've been really focusing on the physical and listening to the patient and, you know, sort of connecting the dots. Let's really do it now and not do any labs and let's see how far I can get. So what did her husband say? Uh, he called me up after that and said, we should get together more. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually supposed to do some, uh, write up some uh, research papers together and, you know, I've so it's been at the bottom of my bucket list, so right. I haven't, but I need to, because now he's semi-retired and he has more time, so wow. that would be good. That, that had to have been quite validating for you. Yeah, it was also quite nerve-wracking, because I'm, I'm sure. like, okay, this is my this professor, up, right. yeah, who I have such high regard for, and he sends me his wife, but she doesn't want any labs done. It's like, this okay. is a test. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Wow. So what do you think is the most important message that you can give to your students when you're teaching? We can send them away with just one piece of, they can walk out with one piece of information. They know a lot more than they think they do, number one. And a, a lot of times it's, um, they may not sort of have looked at things or put them together in the way that I feel like we need to, to really try and help our patients more. A lot of times you have the knowledge, you just don't have the tools to try and figure out how do I put all this together and then develop a protocol for, for a patient. Because really it's about treating each patient as an individual and personalizing um, your care. But I think that like everybody that I meet in the fellowship, they're just amazing human beings and they have a lot of knowledge. They may just not have figured out the way in which they can connect everything that they've learned, you know, and sort of put it together and then apply it to a patient. And I actually have two things. And the other thing is that we all have our own little niche, right? There's all, we all of us, we all have things that we're better at or that we find easier or sort of come easier to us. It's learn to develop that. That's what's going to make you unique. That's what's going to make you different from your colleague down the street. And it's also what's going to draw patients to you. Do you seek mentorship from anyone? Oh, absolutely. I think we all need to be mentored. And, uh, and the nice thing is when, you know, we have... Uh, it becomes sort of a two-way street. You know, it's funny, just recently, one of my mentors, uh, who I call a lot on a constant basis, actually called me for a question on something. And I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. I actually have something to contribute, you know, instead of me being the one that's always calling. Because it's really a two-way street. Because, you know, we all have things that we may know a little bit more about, but sometimes we undervalue ourselves. So your friend Rosa, is she a pediatrician? No, she's not, <laughs> <laughs> but she's still my best friend. <laughs> oh, what is she doing? Uh, she actually takes care of a, a daycare center for at Moffett Field, and she loves what she does. Is there anybody that um, stands out that you particularly admire or inspires you? Oh, Dwight McKee is a big one for me. He's taught in the, uh, the fellowship, particularly in the cancer fellowship. Uh, I think he's just an amazing human being, and he is someone that's able to take all this information and really synthesize it and turn around and say, okay, this is how you can apply it clinically. Um, I have great respect for Dr. Steven Sinatra. I think that uh, he's right on when he t says that, you know, first you, when you're sort of learning and kind of evolving, you want to be really good in the science. You know, you just like, you got to give that all down. 
right? And then you evolved to a certain point, and you kind of got the science, and now you're working more on, so how do I hone my skills, and, and how do I develop this a, a, a protocol? And you're working more on sort of your interaction with patients. And then the third tier, he says, is when you really work on your own profession, not just your own professional development, but your development as a human being and as a spiritual being. And I think that's really true. And sometimes in the beginning, like when we're trying to get the science down, we forget that that part is so important, too. So if you were to run into your old guidance counselor from high school, what would you say to that? As the, you mean the one that I sought out? The one that you sought out yeah. that said to you, you should go to medical school. You should go pre-med. Yeah, why not do this? Um, actually, I've sought, I sought him out. I said, thank you. Thank you for believing in me. And thank you for just you know saying, why not be a doctor? It's like it's a possibility. Uh, it's like anybody has that potential. And sometimes that's all we need to hear is someone else say, yeah, you can do it. It doesn't matter what it is, you can do it. Because all, more often than not, we're told what we cannot do. And not to you know, set your limits. I mean, don't have any limits and aim high and set your expectations high. Because if that's what you expect, that's what you get back, right? It's sort of what you put out there is what you get back. And if you never believe that you can do it, or maybe you, you want, wonder whether you can, but you never have anybody that give you that validation, you know, some of us need that. You know, we need to say, yeah, you can do this. Because, you know, we may have come from cultures where that was sort of undervalued, particularly in women, or we may have just never been told that. And, um, but yet we may have the desire. We just sort of need that reinforcement. I think that same message and uh, uh, lesson can be, um, you know, for, for those physicians that are teetering that are unhappy with what they're doing or frustrated with what they're doing and they're, you know, they're anxious to uh, practice in a different way but haven't quite had the you know, guts to mm -hmm. take that next step. I think that, that lesson and that message is very apropos. You know. No, I think that's really yeah. important too because what I see with a lot of the fellows now is that they're learning but they're afraid to implement it. See, I was forced to. I was already. I had already started a practice, and so as I was learning, I was implementing. I mean, I remember learning about using harm, uh, using progesterone in patients with PMS. And at the nonprofit, I started doing it. And one of my colleagues questioned me, and she was doing the um, Andrew Weil Fellowship. And I said, "Well, haven't you learned that in the fellowship?" And she's like, "No." I said, "Well, I did, and and here are the studies. Here, you know, let's share. And this is what I'm going to do." Uh, which to me was do, I mean learn and do, learn and do. As I was learning things, I was incorporating it. I think it makes it so much easier. And I see a lot of uh, the fellows sort of afraid to incorporate. And I think it's that. It's that they feel like, wait, you know, I'm a little bit uncertain. Can I do this? But yet they have the knowledge. And it's just a matter of having that positive reinforcement or that encouragement you know, from someone else. You're absolutely right. Well, the fellows have already taken the first step, the initial step to, you know, cross the threshold absolutely. to this side and, and, you know, to try to mm -hmm. study it or, you know, to go down this path. It's those physicians that are practicing a They're traditional right. practice. That are know, frustrated. That are frustrated that, you know, are... You know whether they're stuck with that you know stigma of oh it's it's snake oil or what mm -hmm. have you, and they don't want to go down that path, um, and ultimately wind up being miserable doing what they're doing every day. So, yeah, and you know, I see a lot of those. The common the common theme, and we've interviewed I guess over the last few months probably two dozen physicians, and everybody's so happy with what they're doing, and there's no regrets. Mm -hmm. You know the path, and I find that um, incredibly inspiring. And it's um, and also in unfortunate for those traditional practitioners out there who haven't, uh, you know, crossed the... Yeah, who are very frustrated. And right. I see that on a daily basis because the answer, unfortunately, sort of to the whole um, health maintenance organizations and that sort of thing has been to make us work harder, not smarter, and to see more patients and just driving everybody crazy. And even, um, you know, like, some of my friends are still in traditional practices that have mentioned, you know, they've sort of taken enough initiative or had the guts to mention that they're interested in other things, and they'll ask, you know, their staff or um, powers that be, and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we'll support you in that. When they actually set out, they're not supported. And I've had a few that actually left, have left their sort of traditional positions because of that. But I think it's really that frustrated 
um, physician that doesn't think there is anything else out there because that's what tends to happen as you get more and more frustrated and burned out is you feel like you're in this tunnel and things are closing in on you and you have no options and you have to stick where you're at. And the fact is there is. We just need to widen our, our horizons and realize there's always options out there. Even if we are you know, can't see them right then and there, you have to believe there is and look for them because they're there. I think that's a great point to end on, actually. Great.